Clark, and I am calling the Yale Planning Commission meeting to order. Beth, could you please give us a roll call? Commissioner Carlos Perez. Here. Commissioner Bob Howard. Here. Commissioner John Graber. I think he's going to be trying to join us on Zoom here. Uh, Commissioner Richard Lomsdale. Here. Commissioner Ann Wormond. Here. Commissioner Jerry Fijic. And Commissioner John Thompson. Here. Very well. We have enough for a quorum. Um, put us on. Please stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Has everyone had an opportunity to uh, review the attached minutes? No additions or changes? Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Very well. Motion has been seconded and approved. All right, agenda item number five, city staff communications. Are there any communications from the staff? Some updates. Um, first of all, you are aware that we're gonna have a joint meeting with the Thurston County Planning Commission. Yes. And um, we would like to try to get an idea of who wants to be in attendance in person versus Zoom so that we can have the, because the county staff is hosting this. So we want to try to give them as much uh, advance notice as we can if um, they need to, you know, configure the room in a certain way or what have you. So maybe if you could, in the next, I don't know, a few days, uh, email Savannah. I was wondering about, you already know. What about uh, carpooling. Can we think about how we might want to do that if there's more than, because I'd like to attend for uh -huh. sure. Uh, I will too. So maybe we can do How about I would like to attend. Um, I don't know that I'll be going to everything from you know, to there. Oh, okay. That's, All right. How about you? Um, I'm not sure what my schedule is going to be, but I'm going to attend over there. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll probably get attend by Zoom because I'm working that day. And so to try to run all the way down there, it's easier to well, Zoom for the first meeting. Yeah, so you sure. Can Okay. We'll yeah. send you an email. Then. We'll send you an email too. Yeah. All right. Just to... and real quickly, do we have that land use map? Yes. I just want to show you one thing that we're going to be talking about. So over the last few weeks, couple months, I guess, Miriam, Cody, Sarah, and myself have been looking at what's called the future land use map. So the joint plan for the county just applies to our urban growth area. It has, it has nothing to do with the city. So what you're seeing there is our urban growth area. Those are the areas where we expect to annex sometime in the future and bring them into the city. Right now, those areas are all zoned one unit per five acres. That, so that's a rural zone. They're not developing at an urban area. But uh, what we've done is gone through and in an exercise um, modified what we call the future land use or the future zoning from what it was, um, say, in 2017 when they did the last update. And we're adding in more commercial and a little bit more dense residential. So that's going to be kind of the thing that we're going to be discussing with you all um, when you, if you um, and the county both jointly approve the plan. This is kind of setting out the map of what the zoning will look like when we annex properties. I have a question. Um, will you be sending us a pre-review of this? That is, will we get to look at it at home? A copy of the plan? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Excuse me. I, I did receive a email uh, from them that had the um, PowerPoint slides and the agenda and everything for the meeting next week. So oh, you did. I didn't send it out. Yeah, to I, I received it too. So there was like three, three different three different attachments, right? Yeah. 
Of course, I haven't been home for a couple hours, so no, maybe there. <laughs> yeah, they sent it out this afternoon. This afternoon? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I've never seen it yet. Yeah, if it's not in your inbox when you get home, let us know and we'll make sure you get it. This, yeah. this diagram is actually in there. It's in there. Oh, well, Good. Okay. Right. They also asked if you were going to be on Zoom to let them know so they'd give you the link on the email they sent today. Oh, yeah. We can notify both Miriam and them as well. But, yeah. So, um, and the joint plan, just so you know, we had a 2017, um, our comprehensive plan title was, you know, comprehensive and joint plan, but it actually never went through the joint planning process. So they started with our draft and basically it's just been amended for the urban growth area to reflect, um, you know, most of what was in our original draft is still in our draft, but there are certain things that uh, in the county portions uh, aren't appropriate to be in a joint plan. For example, capital facilities plans, you know, because we don't have any control over what goes on in the county as far as capital facilities. That kind of stuff has been amended. So um, beyond that, uh, next on the 23rd, we plan to take the code changes that you approved at hearing to council for adoption. Uh, we have our annexations that have been, um, you guys have seen, I think, uh, months ago. Um, they're ready. Um, we, there may be one that the county wants to delay, but they're going to be going on the 23rd for adoption as well. And then depending on what action you take tonight, if you decide to uh, recommend approval of the rezone, that'll be going on the 23rd also. Um, what is that? That's it, right? Uh, yes, that's it. That's all. I'm anxious to see this. Mm -hmm. All right, is that all that we have with communications? Yes. Communications, all right. Any public comments? Uh, are there anyone, is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the commission regarding any comments uh, on any of the matters on the agenda? All right, there being none, we'll move on to agenda item number seven. Is there any unfinished business from the last meeting? No. No. Move right, right along. <laughs> uh, agenda item number eight. Uh, new business. Staff, you have new business that uh, we need to be made aware of. Well, we're going to kind of follow up on the workshop that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, SCJ has completed a full working draft now of the housing action plan. So Melissa is going to go through that. Um, I want to begin though with Ray Zaw, who surprised me last week uh, in a staff meeting um, when he pulled out a PowerPoint that I hadn't seen before. And there's just two or three slides on there that I thought would be good to introduce Melissa's work because some months ago, I don't know if you're, because he's looking for an apartment or what, but he did a survey of uh, several of the apartment buildings in Yelm, and he's he's got a um, couple tables that that uh, show what the actual rental rates are for these apartments. So that'll give you a starting point for where we are right now in terms of affordability. So can you pull that up, Savannah? The PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Uh, thank you um, all for having me today. Um, before I deliver this presentation, I want to, it's a, it's a short presentation. I want to uh, give you some background and the story behind this. I mean, I, Gary kind of uh, explained some of them. So before I moving to Yelm, uh, I was living in Midwest. So the first thing that I noticed is the, the number of housing that's in Yelm available for uh, rent and also the price, the rent rate. And uh, I had uh, um, so some of the some of the reason that we don't have that uh, housing. I can uh, think of uh, the shortage because of the, due to the COVID problem. Um, but uh, we have uh, some uh, projects uh, uh, from the time that I work for the city of Yelm. So, for example, one of the projects that we had we had a meeting with the. Uh, Habitat for Humanity project that they are uh, trying to provide more affordable housing, uh, which is nice. But uh, we had also a different project 
uh, which is uh, I, um, we have another developer who uh, reached to us and asked about uh, the requirement for uh, ADU's additional dwelling units. And uh, uh, so um, this is, which is uh, a new bill that's uh, from the state of Washington and to kind of provide more housing for the state. And uh, um, so part of the justification for the ADUs, I think that uh, to provide more affordable housing, uh, which is still, I mean, the, the definition of affordable housing is not clear for me, um, but if the developer provide more, uh, 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 if the developer can use the ADUs and build ADUs, if he or she doesn't use the governmental aids or governmental assistance programs. So basically the developer uh, is, uh, doesn't require to provide affordable housing or affordable, uh, uh, or affordable um, rent rate. Uh, so this is kind of a background that encouraged me to take a look at the uh, the definition of affordable housing or what we have right now in the city of Yale. If you go to the next slide. Um, next slide. So if, if you are looking for uh, renting houses, uh, so the new apartments that uh, I, I got the information about two, three weeks ago uh, from the apartment.com website and silo.com. So if you are looking for the new apartment that uh, just built and they're uh, offering the uh, new apartments. So for example, Vinison is an example for uh, apartment. If you uh, want to rent a one bedroom and one bath, it, you have to pay around 1700. If- uh, Can I you just interject something real quick? So this is in Tahoma Terra and it's pretty much already out rented out. So go ahead. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How many units are in that? You know, so a thousand. <laughs> 75. 75. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you go to next slide, for example, yeah, that's good. So, uh, Tahoma Terrace Apartment is, is another new apartments, uh, apartment complex that is almost the same price, which means that uh, it's not that developers are greedy or something because we are uh, seeing the same pattern. Uh, for uh, the price, which is one bedroom, one bathroom, is around again 1700. And if you uh, go to the next slide, for Nisqually Landing is another one, which is we are seeing the same pattern. And uh, if we are looking at the older apartment complex, for example, the Tustin uh, uh, complex, you are seeing it's, it's almost the same as 1600 for one bed and one bathroom apartment. So the price is Kind of the range of the price is kind of the same for it, for the new apartments and a little bit older apartments complex. If you go to the next slide, so if we are uh, if we, if I want to buy a new single family houses, if you go to the next slide, so in, in compared to renting houses, so these are the uh, uh, prices that you can find in Tom uh which is buy by sound built homes. And uh, for two bed, two, uh, the, the average price is five hundred seventeen thousand dollars, and the minimum is uh, for two bedroom, two baths for nine hundred ninety seven square feet is three hundred eighty four thousand. And if you go to the next one, so if for uh, if you go to the Mountain View Meadows, uh, as known as the Hodge Project, so it's going to be the same amount. Uh, so you have to pay around four hundred ninety. Thousand for the average, and the minimum is going to be, uh, I guess, it's going to be four hundred thirty-four thousand. And uh, so another another project, uh, uh, which we can see, it depends on the quality of the building, what features that they provide. We can have, uh, we can see different prices, but the range of the prices, as you can see, is is pretty high. And if you go to the next slide. So if, if you want to uh, get a mortgage, for example, for uh, I was thinking that if you want to get a, a conventional loan with 20% and down payment and with the interest rate of 5.5, which is pretty low for a person who has a, a, an excellent uh, credit score. So it's gonna be 5.5% and you have to pay 2,500 each month. And if you go uh, if if you go for FHA loan, which is three point five percent, you have to pay around three thousand. And if you get the thirty uh, 
years long. And so this is the price for the minimum uh, um, house that I found, which is 384,000. And if you go for a 30 years loan, uh, so it's gonna be a little bit better. Uh, you can pay around 1800 uh, for 20 uh, for 20 percent down down payment, and you have to pay it two thousand and two hundred fifty dollars for three point five fifty percent. Twenty percent. That seventy six thousand dollars is the down payment. Uh, yes. Yes. Good. Yes. And if if you go uh, with uh, um, kind of uh, more bedrooms uh, or more square feet, which is around 490,000, which is not the highest price, even not, I guess it's in the average price, you have to pay, uh, for 20%, you have to pay $98,000. And with, again, with these, these are the, the interest rates here are for uh, excellent square, uh, credit score. So uh, it's gonna be higher for uh, people with, a low, with good uh, square uh, credit score or even average uh, credit score. So these are the, um, um, the situation that we are dealing for the renting uh, and for buying the houses. And uh, I hope that we can come up with some ideas, uh, maybe providing more houses that can be uh, uh, reduce the prices even for renting or buying houses. And thank you so much. Um, were you able to investigate the pricing on the recently constructed townhomes since we've started to have townhomes? These are the ones with the attached, the, um, I think there's six units in one set of attached building. Uh, so these, these are, I guess, most of them are, are detached. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have included uh, duplexes or uh, attached housing, but I can, I can take a look, yes. I'm just, I'm just curious whether there is a, um, a lower cost to those. The fourplexes and the duplexes are tending to be pretty comparable with the apartment rents. The apartment rent? Yeah. So going to be that? So one, one of the thing is, I mean, based on that 20% down, I would say probably a majority of people won't have 20%. And so they're going to also carry mortgage insurance, um, which is another, I don't know what it is, 100, 200 a month more. Yeah, active duty service members, though, bypass that. They can go through the GI Bill, probably nothing down, but of course their payments are going to be higher. Yeah. And they may be a little lower interest rates. And I think now that the military also will give you additional to your housing allowance, depending on the cost of living in particular areas. I don't know if that's still true or not. But anyway, that's kind of the landscape that Melissa is walking on now. That <laughs> Uh, and on that note, thank you. Thank you, thank you. for that. That was eye opening. Very. Our plans. Yeah. Our Yeah. Sorry, I missed half of what you said. <laughs> Um, so today we're just kind of going over a brief overview of the um, housing needs analysis and then um, discussing the review of the working draft. So just keep in mind that the draft that you guys saw is not final. It's not set in stone. We can rework it however you need. We just wanted to make sure that you guys saw it as we were working on it so that we could get comments back. I did see Carlos's um, and I'm sure that if you guys um, gave any comments already to Gary that they reported to me, <laughs> I keep all of them before I look, I keep them in a specific uh, Word document so that I can kind of combine them by, you know, essentially. Um, Okay, so the housing action plan timeline, what we were looking at, we started back in November 2021 when Washington Department of Commerce awarded the city of Yelm $75,000 grant to start the housing action plan. Um, back in August 2022, um, Yelm contracted with SEJ Alliance to complete the HAP. Um, you'll hear me say HAP, it's obviously the Housing Action Plan. Um, 
October, we started the community interviews and public participation plan. Um, and then through November, um, we did the housing and needs analysis presentation and um, completed the housing needs analysis work in January. Um, so since May, we've been working on the, or since May, <laughs> since uh, January, we've been working on the um, working draft. Um, we did a little bit before that, but the housing needs analysis is a really large component of a housing action plan. Um, and so now we're working on the um, the comments, kind of reviewing what the city is looking for, making sure that everything's on the right track so that we can move forward and um, bring it back to planning commission for your guys' review and um, approval for city council next month. Um, so earlier, well, today, uh, the SEPA was issued. Yes. Is that right? No. Actually, and I, I made that change. It, it must not have got carried over, but uh, I that's the only thing in your presentation I changed that's the 23rd. Of last month. No. Of this month. Coming up. Yeah. Okay. We're planning to issue their SEPA determination. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the next step really to make sure to get done is the SEPA. Um, city staff are going to issue that public comment will um, a com public comment period will be open, um, which just basically means that if anybody has concerns about the environmental impact of the housing action plan in the um, proposed um, solutions and just kind of uh, goals and actions that are in there, um, they can go ahead and, and let the let us know their concerns. Um, so as I said earlier, June 20th is the tentative um, planning commission public hearing and recommendation. And then June 27th will be the city council review and approval um, because the deadline to submit the housing action plan and all grant deliverables is uh, June 30th. Uh, okay, so there are, there are a couple of things that cities can do to assist in um, kind of promoting housing in their um, jurisdictions. And so that's really development incentives, basically encouraging construction, um, really it's tax exemptions, density bonuses, anything that makes a developer go, I want to build there, not there. Um, and we're really just, you know, focusing on things that say Yelm is the place to be. This is, you know, we want the housing here. Um, you can update development regulations. Um, those are zoning and design standards. Usually if you have more flexible uh, design standards, developers tend to prefer that because if they get too stringent, it can cost them a lot of money. And if it costs them money, they usually uh, aren't a fan of that. I'll put it that way. Um, the city can also provide financial assistance. Not all jurisdictions are able to do this. So there are a couple of different ways you can do that. You can do direct funding, you can do fee waivers, land donations, um, but most of it, it's, it's harder on cities to do these without a lot of free planning. And usually those goals are very long-term. Um, so you start it and usually it's like seven to 10 years later, it's actually being implemented in full and force. Um, sometimes it's faster. And then the other thing with the city of Yelm is pretty good about is partnering with providers. So that's Habitat for Humanity, Homes First, um, faith-based organizations, anybody who's out there that's a nonprofit or sometimes not nonprofit that will assist in housing solutions and they want to support the community. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Kind of a review over the housing needs assessment summary. Um, so obviously, Yelm is growing. We've kind of covered that in, I think, every meeting. <laughs> and the uh, projected growth is about 24,000 by 2040. Thank you. So uh, median household income, this is 2021 data. This is from when we did the housing needs assessment was um, 92,519 for homeowners and 48,634 for renters. Um, and then for an average between both was about 83,027. But as you can see, there is a large disparity between household income and rental income or um, homeowners and renters incomes. Um, Yelm is slightly above the median household 
um, income when you look at regional. So as you can see, Washington um, in 2021 was 82,400. Thurston County was a little lower at 81,501. Yelm was above both, which was 83,027. Thank you. So um, we discussed this a little bit at the last meeting. Basically, um, there are about 42% of young households that are earning less than 80% of the area median income. Um, this is a pretty common threshold for subsidized housing eligibility. Um, and about 30% of Yelm's households are severely cost burdened. That essentially just means that they are spending more than 30% of their monthly income towards housing costs. Um, and some are even spending over half their income in housing costs. So Yelm's households are generally larger. Um, about 56% of the households have three or more people, and only about 17% of your households are one-person households. Um, Yelm also has a larger percentage of very young families, um, which typically the concern with very young families is either they are um, one-income households, where you know the, the mom or the dad, one of the parents is staying home to watch the children so that you're not they're not paying high daycare costs, or they're paying high daycare costs. So not great either way. Excuse me. We did a little bit of research in regard to um joint based Lewis McCord service members. Um so there are nearly about 55,000 service members at JBLM with an estimated about 3.5% reporting that they actually live in Yelm. Um, most of those service members rent rather than own. Uh, usually it's a pick up and leave kind of situation um, and, or they own detached single family homes. And then, so they pay, yeah, about 15, 1500 to 2200 a month. <laughs> It's a little bit less than um, most, and I think that's a lot. It has to do with the GI Bill and, and specific things that are available to them. It also has to do with, I forget what it's exactly called, the housing allowance, the base house. Thank you. Um, I know the acronym, but I couldn't remember what it stood for, so I apologize. So, um, yeah, only about 26% of the um, service members seem to actually own a home. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of people to accommodate for. Next slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so Yelm has done really well in um, ensuring that there is housing inventory, at least somewhat available. Um, as you can see on the first graph, it has slowly upticked where occupied housing and total housing units has kind of come to a close proximity. What that means is that there's a low vacancy rate. Um, when there is a low vacancy rate, prices typically skyrocket. And what happens is the vacant housing is usually either in disrepair or it's not, you know, basically it's in disrepair um, or it's just off the market period. Um, so on average, there's been about 99 units built each year since 2010. A large majority of those are detached single family units. Thank you. So over time, um, housing costs have risen. Not shocking. I don't think that's going to shock anybody. Um, they had a couple of spikes, but for the most part, the estimated typical home value for the region in July of 2022 was 4,450,000 4, essentially. Um, as Reza showed, it's definitely gone up, especially with all of the new housing coming in. Um, and right now it doesn't look like it's going to go back down, um, which is the whole point of the housing action plan to make sure that we're, we as the city are doing everything that you guys can. Go ahead. So um, this is a graph that shows the kind of the cross-reference of median gross rent and median home value and median household income. So as you can see, as the median household income has changed, uh, median house home value has also kind of stuck with that for the most part. It's definitely a lot less um, 
fluctuating. Median gross rent, rent fluctuates a lot more than home values. Um, so that is something to keep in mind in regard to um, actions as we move forward. Um, so they did see a, a brief dip in home values and income between 2014 and 2015, and then everything basically soared. Next slide. Thank you. So this is basically a graph that just shows the number of renter households or the number of households, I should say, versus the affordable housing units. So one side is renters and one side is owners. Um, and so what you'll see is in gray on both graphs is the number of households that need that, um, that bracket, essentially. Um, and then in green and blue is what is actually available. Um, there are a lot of units available to people who make over 75,000, um, especially renters. There's not a lot, there's a lot more households for renters that um, need assistance or, you know, don't make more than 50,000 a year. Um, and we kind of saw that earlier with the, um, with the AMI. And then owner households, this is pretty typical, um, but unfortunately with house owning a house, there's a certain sliding scale where if you're making less than 20K, it's exceedingly hard to get a house. Um, so basically there are options, programs like Homes for Humanity, Homes First that kind of help to um, get people into housing when they're making that um, uh, low of an income. Um, and that is discussed more in the uh, the draft. Next. Thank you. Um, so Yelm is forecasted uh, to need about 5,500 additional units by 2045. Um, it's a lot of units. You guys do have the land capacity as of right now to um, to get there, but it is going to take some creative liberties. Um, go ahead. Thank you. So the five goals for the housing action plan that we found were encourage a variety of housing types, densities, and a range of affordable housing units. Um, utilize outside funding or assistance resources to pursue housing goals. Reduce costs to allow more low and moderate income housing options. Increase accessibility through urban and transit corridors and add more permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. Um, the six actions specifically were reduce the cost of housing for low income and cost burden households, and that is under affordability. Supplies increase the inventory of housing for all households. Transit is increased connectivity through accessible transit options to support housing. People like to live where they can walk to local convenience stores um, or other <laughs> um, fun things. Uh, middle housing is really focused on variety. It's increasing the variety of housing sizes and types. Accessibility is supportive housing um, options for seniors, disabilities, low income. Um, and anti-displacement is uh, managing neighborhood change resulting from new investment in housing. Essentially, if you put in a really nice, um, you know, really nice apartment complex and it's luxury and everything goes up in price, Typically what happens is everything else also goes up in price. And anti-displacement is a, um, a required action and or goal by commerce this year. Um, affordability, variety and, or affordability supply and anti-displacement are all required goals um, because those are the biggest concerns. We want new housing. We want, um, we want people to be able to afford that new housing. And we don't want to displace people who can't afford that housing, but already do have um, existing households. So, so as part of the implementation tables, um, essentially what we did was we went through each goal and action. Um, we advised, you know, who would be leading that goal. 
largely it's the community development team, um, and then what type of action and then the proposed timing. So short term was one to three years, midterm was within about six years, and I believe long term, which there um, are maybe one or two goals that are like that are 10 or more or over something like that over six years. Um, so as you can kind of see, the this is the goal is encourage a variety of housing types, densities, and a range of affordable housing units. Um, so um, it's like allow more housing types in commercial zones. Make sure that you know anybody who wants to build a house in a commercial zone, um, not necessarily a house, but like an apartment complex, something like that, maybe a um, uh, homework kind of situation where they have housing up top and working down below, um, then it would be community development led, it would be a legislative action, and it would be a short term one to three year turnaround. That's how to read that. Good. Thank you. Um, in the, I'm not going to read all of these, but if you have any questions or comments, please um, just send them over to Gary or Miriam. Um, because they are all in the draft, I promise you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so the next steps for the housing action plan, are we're working on um, the draft review right now. We're asking for comments. Um, so please, if you have any comments, you can either ask them now. I prefer um, mostly because I like everything written down. Um, if you can get everything all in one and email them over to city staff, they'll forward it along so that we can make sure everything gets incorporated. I don't want to lose anything. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, of course. SEPA will be issued later this month. Um, and then, of course, we're back to Planning Commission and City Council next month. Yeah, I think you have any questions. I apologize. You said that we should send our any uh, comments and such on to Miriam, and then it, uh, then we'll go to you. Yeah, uh, that's my preference, just because it makes sure that everything's actually taken into consideration and nothing's missed. You're more than welcome to sit here and, and say, "Hey, the, these are my comments." Absolutely, I will take them down. Um, I just know that a lot of people do prefer that because you can sit there, you can think about it, develop that thought, and actually put it down. Um, but it's whatever your preference is. I know Carla said it. <laughs> It's not yours. Uh, uh, no, I have questions about uh, new questions. Uh, the uh, the 5,500 units that we are lacking in 2034, do we know how many of them are uh, for median or less than median income people and how much? I don't know. I've missed that if we covered it. It wasn't in this presentation, but it is in the housing needs us analysis. Yeah, it is in the housing needs analysis. I don't believe it's in the draft. So, um, and I think that you guys were all forwarded that, but um, basically it does, the housing needs analysis does um, break down by income level of um, what the expectation is. Now, here's the caveat to that. When we did the calculations, we used the 2021 percentages that were already um, within the city. So basically like if, um, if there was a household making less than 20,000 and there were 17 households and it was 6.2%, then what we did was we projected what was the need from that 6.2%, if that makes sense. So if it was 10 or if it was 17 now, it's whatever, 25 then if that makes sense, but it's based off the 2021 percentage. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, I believe it was Commerce put out the um, a actual table that we will reference in the, the, the draft, um, and that is based off of Commerce's calculations for each, um, for requirements for each income level. And that will be slightly different, and we'll explain that in the draft, um, but Yes, we do have that information as to what those projections should look like. Can you tell me now, just off your head, is it more towards the less than median income as far as the numbers of houses, housing units required? There is a shift towards um, low 
extremely low, low and uh, moderate income household needs. Um, Commerce is aware of that. And so that's how a lot of that projection says that housing should be built, if that makes sense. So basically, high end housing, it's always going to be there. There's always going to be developers who want to spend a million dollars to sell a 2.5 million house, right? It's more difficult for cities to bring in developers who, you know, want to make the bare minimum to make sure that other people can afford their houses. Um, and so that's what commerce is concerned with. And that's also, we there were a lot of bills passed this, um, this year that really support the, um, the low and moderate income. Um, as Reza was saying is, you know, the ADU bills where it's kind of um, forcing, um, I wouldn't say forcing, it's requiring that jurisdictions add ADU language to their um, development regulations if they don't already have it. You guys do have ADU language. Um, and then in some jurisdictions, if you're over a certain population, it requires two, uh, the allowance to two ADUs per slot. So it just depends. But there's still, um, I haven't read that language. I just know that that's the, uh, the general consensus from what I understand. So there are some things that will have to be worked in um, as the city progresses and as those specific bills are kind of mentioned and, and uh, brought out. One slide. So can I add to that? Oh, of course. There's a few things. Um, since the housing needs analysis was initiated or whatever, this process that Melissa's uh, describing has started to come into place where what's going to happen is Department of Commerce will issue numbers for every county in the state that's planning under the Growth Management Act, mm -hmm. saying on a countywide basis, you need to supply this number of um, extremely low income housing, uh, low income, affordable, very low income. There are all those different categories. And if you could go down to that bottom, very bottom slide there, this don't. Uh, this is just kind of an example of playing around with their tool of the kinds of housing we might be looking at needing to supply. So like the extremely low income units would be uh, 76. So those are people that are making between zero and 30% of the area's median income. So the area's median income is 80 some thousand. That number um, of 76 units would be for people who are probably making a little bit less than $30,000 a year. So that's a very challenging goal to reach. Um, so how do we balance that kind of projection that is imposed on us with the lack of total units that we're predicting in the future? Uh, well, I'll tell you how Leonard Bauer at City of Olympia put it. Okay. These are aspirational numbers. Because <laughs> um, it is going to be really challenging. Those that extremely low and probably even up to the 50, maybe even up to the 80 percent. I mean, we're going to probably need to work with um, entities like Melissa said, partners like Habitat for Humanity or other entities who specialize in this, who know how to get funding for it. Um, because again, we're not even keeping up with market rate demand. And when there's no incentive, I mean, it's very hard to even provide a whole list of incentives that are going to, um, you know, for most developers entice them into building something that they can otherwise make the maximum amount of profit on. Exactly. Uh, but that's not all though, because I will say, and um, this is through Chris, we, uh, the developers of Windstone and what's the other department? Oh, it's Roma Boulevard. Yeah, okay. The, um, they both uh, reached out to us um, to uh, set up a meeting to talk about what their options might be for doing some affordable units. So we're going to meet with them next or next Monday, I believe it is. And um, we've invited the affordable housing program coordinator from Olympia to set in because they've much farther down the pathway than we are in terms of coming up with some of these um, actual physical projects. And we're gonna meet with them and talk about what tools are that are out there. And then they're gonna give us a tour of the apartments. So, that so was... there are some conscientious people out there. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Good. Do you see a future, you know, right now the, the highest probability of those in the 30% will never buy no matter what was available. They'll always be trapped into the rental 
I don't remember okay. what the. Uh, and I don't know if that's going to change in the future because of the problem that oftentimes they're they don't stay a long time. They may move from place to place, and historically, most of those people rent never buy. And I don't know if that will change even in twenty years. Well, I think. And I don't remember now, but I think like the Habitat for Humanity model is for ownership. It I is, yeah. Remember what the it would be interesting to see what percentage they use. Thirty to fifty. Yeah. Okay, so that's you know. Okay. Well, it's obvious there's really no problems in incentivizing people to builders to build the better homes and the bigger homes. So it's like, what what all incentives are we going to be able to? Well, so another, another incentive that um, is being required of us, so the ADU legislation that just came out now requires cities under Growth Management Act to allow for two ADUs on every residential property. But it has another requirement, which I think kind of works against affordability because you're not allowed to limit the square footage below a thousand square feet. Oh, really? Whereas ADUs typically in the past, I mean, some jurisdictions go bigger, but typically they're like 850 square feet. Oh, right. And that makes it, I mean, people can build them at that, but the cities can't require them to build at less than a thousand square feet. So that kind of, you know, ups the. Yeah. And then the thing about whether or not they can rent them out to someone else other than the mother-in-law. Oh, so that's another thing that they put in the. The other thing they put into the legislation is now the property, you cannot require the property owner to live on the parcel. And then there are other things that are, from a planning standpoint, are kind of problematic because, I mean, when we do planning and somebody does a subdivision and they do, let's say, 30 lots, we, we want them to analyze what their traffic impacts are going to be and other kinds of impacts, stormwater. You can't do that with ADUs. You can only do it based on the number of lots. So, um, and I've heard arguments both ways as to whether or not it's that big of a deal. Because if you've got a smaller house with two small ADUs, is it really having any more traffic impact than a big house with you know? Does the size of the lot impact on that too? Yes, because you, you have. still have to meet your setback requirements for the lot. And um, so. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry, but oh, any other questions? Yeah, real, real quick, you'd mentioned, I think you said that uh, JBLM said that three and a half percent of the military lived here in Yelm. Do you do you know where those figures came from? Uh, straight off their website, I believe. I can double check the HMA. The housing needs analysis has a, um, a source to it, um, but I can double check and get that too. Okay. Um, re reason I was asking is I brought up a, a few times about being involved uh, at Lakewood. There's, um, I can't remember the name of it offhand, the organization where uh, JBLM works with a lot of the local communities on trying to get affordable housing for military members and, and things like that. So I'm not sure. Um, I think the mayor is supposed to be a participant in that organization, but I don't know um, if anything is being done to participate in that, to you know, help the military members. And, and so that's kind of why I was wondering where that three and a half percent came from and if it was working with that organization or. Um, um, that's a great question. So Dan Penrose, um, who's who I'm working with in, uh, in regard to the HAP, uh, he's the one that kind of has worked with the military and JBLM more often. Um, and uh, he also was part of developing a, a previous JBLM housing report, um, which I believe might, those numbers might have come from that. Um, and I apologize, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but that would be a great question for him because I I remember that he was talking about that organization because they are really active in trying to get housing. Um, and I know that they were also trying to um, put something for it, but I don't remember what it was. Um, but I can discuss that further with him and um, maybe get some information back to you. Okay. Yeah, it's just my, my point is just that so, somehow if we're kind of, you know, including that, you know, in there since it is a big uh, participation with a lot of the local communities and, and everything that, you know, we're kind of involved in that and make sure that our 
numbers for you know the military or right so. yeah absolutely is there another thing you might look at with the military you know you look at fifty five thousand you know you might have twenty five thousand that are single living on base and so it'd be interesting to break down the fifty five thousand that are actually families percentage mm -hmm. because I was looking at even at fifty five thousand that would mean there was one thousand eight hundred and seventy five families living in Yelm city limits which I question maybe that there's that many because that would be a third of the city of Yelm is military. Well, most of them are over in Cherry Meadows. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I'm not, it was interesting because at first you say that's not very much, but it, I don't think there's 1,875 military families physically within the city limits of Yelm. There might be. No, that'd be a pretty high number. Not active, right? So pretty retired, maybe, but. Yeah. I know, Cody, I don't know if you want to speak to this or not, but you were contacted. Well, we've had two different contacts okay. regarding military housing. The, the first one, what was the organ, I think? So there's GMH is one, General Military Housing, and then we yeah. meet with the South Sound Military Community, yeah. which that's, I that's, that's the, Yeah, that's the one that I was talking about. We just had our breakfast last week um, where they came up, they had their housing analysis that they just did in 2019, but they're redoing it again next year because 2019, the housing analysis took place during 19 and 20 when pandemic hit. And they said their numbers are completely skewed, so it's not accurate. So they're redoing that now, but I'm sure that they can um, SCJ can pull those numbers because they're. I, I did see that previous report. So, and then we, while well, we were also, we had a meeting with a fellow a couple of weeks ago who's, uh, and I think he's just doing this on a, uh, I didn't quite understand the model, to be honest with you, but he's interested in property. Um, what's the address? Uh, Burnett, off Burnett Road. Off Burnett Road. Yeah. yeah. So there's two groups we talked to that are. They're kind of looking at new models similar to if you've ever been overseas in the military where they have bases that are kind of contained where you have housing and there's like an NEX or a, uh, what they call PX on base or the medical center and it's all located in one area. They're working on that same kind of model in towns around America. So they're looking at Yelm's kind of pilot project to build a self-contained military community that will have military housing, they'll have like a, you know, a base medicine med that they get some urban care, they'll have a little PX store that they go shopping at and maybe some other stuff um, all in one area. So that's that they're working, they're working on a pilot program. Right now. Who, I'm just, sorry, who, who's doing that again? This is GMH General Military Housing Group. Okay. So they're sent by the Homeland Security Department of Defense and actually it's a creative pilot on this. So the, the comments that I submitted, will you address those separately or do you want me to go over one or two of those? What's your preference? Well, for instance, uh, what does aging in place mean? I don't understand that. Essentially, um, okay, I will say I'm 30. So if I say anything, essentially, when um, when as as people age, you typically need different accommodations. So, um, for instance, my grandmother needed not to have stairs in her house, and so they needed to move. So aging in place just means that there is a place that they can stay as they age so that they're not having to move around. Um, so sometimes that's like 55 plus communities where you might be super active at 55. You don't need it, but you get in there and you don't have to. You can be 97 and you're good you don't have to move. Um, it, it does depend. Um, the definition can change from community to community, but essentially it's just making sure that senior citizens have a place to go that is accessible, uh, maybe all ADA compliant, um, basically just whatever happens, they don't have to move. That answers my question. Another question on the housing goals and actions that you showed, yeah. who conducts that evaluation of the impact? Can you clarify? <laughs> What's that? Can you clarify that? Well, uh, can you go to that slide of the housing housing goals and actions? I think that's on page 25 of the draft. Was it where it specified like the action and then it said um, who does it, the community yeah. development? So there it is right here. It's uh, action one. Encourage, uh, this is about encouraging a variety of housing types, quality, densities, and a range of affordable housing. As part of the comprehensive plan and development code changes include an evaluation of the impact which cha 
such changes will have on housing affordability, especially for low income households. So who conducts that evaluation? It can be dependent. So uh, jurisdictions can choose to do their own evaluations. A lot of time, uh, a lot of times things come back down from commerce in regard to the um, growth management act bill, stuff like that, where they'll say, hey, you know, here's something that you need to consider. Here's an impact. Um, sometimes it's just literally the consideration of like just saying, okay, I'm considering that this might hurt somebody. This might hurt this population set. It's dependent. Um, you have a better answer in regard to that? Well, I have, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say better, but I just, have more I just have more information on this. Um, because we are, we have an RFP out right now, request for proposals to do our comp plan update and development codes. And as part of that update, well, we will be hiring a consultant and assuming that goal gets adopted, we will fold that into our contract with the consultant to do that analysis. Um, so we've got um, 325,000 to do the update and the uh, do both updates, the code and the housing. So, you know, uh, much of what we do here for this housing action plan will be incorporated into our comp plan. Okay. That's it. So I have anyone else have more questions? Well then, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. If any other questions pop up, just say again. If any other questions pop up, just forward them up. So when we come next month, we're going to be coming for a hearing on this with a proposed final draft, just so you know, because we're trying to meet this June 30 deadline. And obviously, I mean, we've already gone through those goals and actions before, but those will probably be the things that be the most important to you know, decide whether you agree or disagree with. Um, what would be our deadline for getting our comments back to Miriam that then goes on? As soon as possible, but um, I'd say the preference would be at least by, at the very latest, by the end of the month. Um, comments, sometimes they're questions. So um, put you on the spot. Carlos um, had both questions about like graphs and different um, like verbiage, stuff like that, but also like, okay, why is this here as opposed to over here? Um, so it can kind of be both. Um, I will eat, I'll respond back to your email and, and forward it to Gary, just so that you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, it's whatever your preference is. If you read through it and you just need clarification, that's great. We appreciate those comments because it makes it ensures that when the general public, if they choose to read this document, they know what um, you know what we're trying to say and what message we're trying to convey. I call it planner ease. Um, basically, you know, we talk in development code or we talk in goals and strategies. And um, so we do our best in the final document, it'll be um, kind of more simplified um, so that it's easier to read. But that's why we need your comments to say, I don't understand that. What does this graph mean? What is that, you know, what does third party review mean? What is, you know, whatever, um, or, I don't like that goal. That's a valid comment. Um, I don't understand this, whatever it may be. Um, essentially, there are no stupid questions or answers or whatever, because it helps us get to that final document and ensures that the public understands it. Thank you. It's a lot of good work. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, that I think completes item Agenda number eight, and we are now going to the public hearing, which is item agenda number nine. So it is 459 today, Monday, and I am opening the uh, Planning Commission's public hearing. It is today to propose a rezoning of parcels. Two one seven two four one two zero two zero zero and parcel number two one seven two four one two zero one zero zero from a commercial C one to a moderate density residential R six zone. 
I'll now open the floor for testimony. If there's anyone that wishes to speak this afternoon, uh, if you're on, is, do we have people on, on the internet? Or if not, uh, anyone here that needs to address the commission? I don't think we have anybody. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if you want me to say anything out of the staff report. I'm happy not to. I would know that the applicant is here. Let me ask the commissioner. The commissioners, have you had an opportunity to read the uh, uh I would appreciate it. Okay. Summary. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Would you okay. well, I'll be very brief? I'm not going to read the staff report, <laughs> but um, the, the applicant is Derek Edwards. Um, these parcels have been before the planning commission before, and it's kind of, I don't know the whole orchard history on this one, but um, but we have reviewed the proposal. And I think in light of what you just heard tonight um, about our housing needs, um, we determined that it would be in the interest of the city and it's still um, consistent with the comp plan and all of our other de development code um, regulations to, um, recommend approving a rezone of these two properties from the C1 to the uh, moderate density residential, which is basically uh, up to six units per acre. Uh, there's still a commercial piece that buffers these sites from Yelm Highway, so they can still have a commercial strip, and it is adjacent to the same, same zoning, so it's consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. So, that's the short and sweet of it, and um, we're recommending that you um, vote to uh, recommend it to the city council. Very well, and I want to compliment whoever it was that put together this analysis of the uh, rezoning project. Or well, I want to I want to confess what I did because this has been through you guys before. I stole Grant Beck's old report and I just modified it enough to meet the uh, current situation. So give Grant the credit on it. Well done, no, I think it simplifies our having to review it. Very well then. Um, there's no testimony that I can hear other than what Gary has told us. So, no further questions from the commissioners. Any questions regarding the rezoning? All right, no testimony. So, I'll close the hearing at 5.02. Do I hear a motion to accept this rezoning? Anyone? I'll make the motion for the rezone. I'll second. Very well, the motion has been seconded. All those in favor, raise your, or say aye. 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 All those against, nay, none. There being none, we approve. All right. Okay. Well, we'll be taking it to council next week then. So, very well. And then uh, the only last thing, if I could, um, yes, of course. Go ahead. for the next month, uh, Planning Commission, in addition to having a hearing on the Housing Action Plan, uh, architect Ron Thomas is going to be here to do a little presentation on uh, multi, multi mixed use multifamily development and some of the things we might need to do to change our zoning to allow for for more mixed use multifamily. Um, so just be prepared for that. That should be entertaining. I think he's been before you before. So, all right. Let's proceed on to item ten of the agenda. Do we have any reports from the members of the commission? Um, I, can report, I can report on the parts okay. that um, we have the documents signed for the grants that pay for the dog park. Oh, and so they're proceeding with uh, being able to uh, engage um, bids. And, um, and one of the next things that's uh, we're going to look for is, um, I wish Cody was still here so he could say, we were, um, for the dog park, there are various things such as um, pretend fire hydrants for the dogs and, and other dog toy type things that would be in the dog park that uh, we're looking for um, donations from businesses or individuals who would want to have their name on the, the placard. Uh, oh. For that particular 
item that would be in the <laughs> don't, don't put my placard on these. <laughs> so it's um um so it's it's going ahead it's going to happen um and um the uh, the design work that's going on for the new um uh, um, the new stage oh yes, the, yes. Um, in the park. and uh so we should have that uh the design um ready to be able to uh from the parks uh or to be able to show the rest of the planning commission what's proposed um within another month or so there's just I never can tell for sure if we're going to actually get it before the next meeting, but it will be uh, during the summer. We'll be able to see that because the construction on it will occur uh, after the summertime. And um, I'd say other announcements are that um, we also have a, the full go ahead on doing the rails to trails uh, conversion of the Prairie Line Trail uh, from the endpoint. Uh, that's by the Centralia Power Canal, all the way to the edge of um, Nisqually River. And what we're waiting for is just the design of the uh, overlook that's going to be right there at the bridge um, until we do the next phase that opens up the bridge and we go across to Roy, we'll at least have an overlook right at the um, bridge. Right. And um, so, um, I haven't gotten the word yet from Cody that they're that they're what the date is that they're going to start pulling up the rails, but um, it's a matter of getting on the schedule for the guys that do that. So it's imminent. It's imminent. <laughs> Very good. Imminent to make that happen. Um, that's that's pretty much it. Except um, I saw today that the um, um, the work that's going on with the splash park is to um, you know double check and do testing of the water. of the water and they managed to do it so that some of the kids could uh, get a little bit cooled off today yeah. Yeah, for sure. uh, but it actually opens on memorial day sure. and so that's uh no other comments do i hear any motions to adjourn uh, real quickly if i may on behalf of the city board we had our Arbor Day celebration last month. It was a very beautiful day, so the turnout was low, but the participation was great. You know, there was a lot of really incredible art submitted. We had a choir perform. We had one of the school's bands perform. So the involvement was kind of behind the scenes in the matter of speaking, but it was just too beautiful of a day for people to be inside. But I thought about it. Yeah, it was still very worthwhile. It really was. It was by no means a waste of time, but uh, we're, I'm sure we'll see much better attendance next year. Uh, but the people we're aiming to please, please and that was basically the kids and children in the community. So uh, the tree board will break for the summer and then kick it back up again in the fall. The other thing the tree board's doing is working with property owners on the overtopping trees, because once you cut all the canopy off of the tree, it's really not a tree anymore. It's just a stick sticking out of the ground. There's no point in that. So we're working with uh, property owners and business owners on getting those trees replaced or repaired so they function in the way they were intended to. Now, is this along the avenues or, or is this, you know, back in the woods somewhere? Where you talking? This is uh, along the avenues and landscape trees that are within shopping plazas because people have chosen to cut all the foliage and branches off of trees. So that does not provide any sun cover, this does not break down any wind patterns, and it does not retain stormwater the way it's intended to. It's basically a giant stick that's standing out of the air, and there's just no point in that. So I've had property owners, business owners fight with me that, well, this is on private property, but they are in violation of their landscape agreement. So it's something the tree board's working with them on. Uh, that's everything to the tree board. Thank you for those people who are doing that. All right. Any other reports? Hi. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I'd like to hear again. Who do I send an email to to state for sure that I'm going to be going in person to the Thurston County? Huh? 
Um, you can send it to me. Yeah. Okay. We're all sharing them with each other anyway. So. Yeah. Okay, then. Now, do I hear any motions to adjourn? I'll make a motion. I second. Okay, motion, motion has been seconded. We are now adjourned. Now, there are other Robert Rules of Order that said that the chairman can just adjourn a meeting.